All right. So we're going to take the questions in order. That seems reasonable. Uh, the first question is, what can financial institutions and community-based organizations do to increase engagement of working age adults with disabilities with mainstream financial products and services? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe six groups. All right, is there a volunteer for a group who'd like to go first and share, share your, um, your best two ideas and recommendations on question one? Just, you gotta limit. All right, so we don't want them all. You gotta pick two. You need a microphone, though. Okay. All right, this fabulous group over here uh, so came up with uh, establishing focus groups and to and work on finding out what products and services uh, working age adults with disabilities actually need and then establishing a protocol to make that happen. And then the other thing uh, that we discussed as an idea is doing an open enrollment type model like employers have where that when the insurances come, all the insurances come in, do that with financial education and let banks and, fi uh, and credit unions and other financial institutions come in to provide uh, financial education, talk about their products and services, et cetera. Okay, so I might have missed your first. I get the second one about a, an open enrollment period with with sort of a very compressed but uh, partnership with banks uh, around financial education. What was your first one? The first one was establishing focus groups and opening up the lines of communication oh, okay. between the financial institutions and people with disabilities, but talking to individuals with disabilities and employees with disabilities about what products and services they need and then addressing that um, at the financial institution level. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do we have a, a second table? How about, okay, there in the middle, middle of the room. Hold it. Hold it one sec. We've got to get you a microphone. Okay. Um, all right. Our group came up with some really good stuff, but um, collaborate with disability organizations to provide information and services. And um, most important is start educating at the school level at, at, as early as possible, the younger the better, so that when they do transition out as young adults, they'll have the, the financial knowledge that they're looking for. Okay, thank you. And up here in the front. Um, also support transition transitions for out of, going out of school, out of high school, and out of college into the real world and into jobs. So there can be some su support for people with disabilities in that arena, or more support, as well as more, and, um, more job fairs for people with disabilities, including, and at some of those job fairs too, there can be re other resources like disaster relief and you know, financial stability. Right, great, thank you. I forgot the instructions, Michael, so I guess, am I answering number one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so uh, marketing and advertising. We were talking about that. Um, you know, financial institutions need to market to minorities, but rarely do we see a marketing specifically to people with disabilities. So that this group thought that that would be um, a, a great uh, way to get people involved. Um, financial institutes taking an advocacy or roles uh, role, so that they're out there in the community that they can advocate with people for dis with disabilities. Um, to encourage that relationship. Uh, awareness of ac accessibility, Danny, you did a great job over here with this group. Um, they realized, you know, that there's a lot that they need to think about with accessibility and are we accessible and then it, when they are, that they market that to the dis disabled commu uh, community. And then um, collaborating with a clear intention to support families um, that have uh, people with disabilities that they love. So 
all of us coming together today at this financial summit is, a, is, an, is, a, is what we need to be doing and collaborating and not working in silos. Okay. I think there's one more group over here. So our group really um, echoed everything that was said in the room. So as the last, we find that many of the things that we have written down were some of the things that were said. So once some uh, additional things were that the need for survey to survey the population and for disability council to do roundtable conferences and as far as the bank doing outreach programs and we looked at it where we want to see people with disability when they go into an area to see images that represents them because when you go into a community, a bank, a bank in a community always represent that community. And so when you go into the community, we want to see people with disability that when you look at pictures within that bank. Also, if you look, you don't see counters that are uh, low enough or make people with disability feel welcome. So these are things that we must be mindful of as far as changing the mindset. And also when we talk about schools, as far as going back to schools and educating the kids and make sure that we start at an early age to bring about that awareness. Um, and so we basically want to focus on corporation and getting those um, companies that are able to finance or have the funding to do advertising or to do PR work where the knowledge of where people actually knows and have access to information. So it's all about advertising publicity and bringing awareness to change the mindset to further the cause. Okay. Thank you. Great. Was there anyone with, um, not limiting you to your, your top choices, was there uh, another comment you have before we move to question two that you feel uh, wasn't covered by the group? Anyone have an additional item? Yeah, in the middle. Okay. All right. Okay, let's go to question two. Is this is uh, how this is different than the first question is so banks have done a better job and so they have more customers with disabilities. What do they need to do though to hold on and grow those and, and, and sustain those relationships? That's part of question two. And the other part is uh, they're as a person with a disability, what do I want from a banking relationship? So really two different questions, but uh, is there a group who wants to start that right here in the front? Um, so one of the things that we uh, discussed was that um, the whole concept of loyalty. If I'm loyal to a financial institution, I want, we want to have some kind of, some kind of assurance that should something, should a catastrophic injury happen, or should uh, you acquire a disability that you're not going to be booted out of the system? Some way of working with that individual to um, stay, stay in the, the, the system. I, one of the stories I was sharing was that I've worked with people who have acquired a disability. One of the reasons they're unbanked currently is that they were banked before they acquired their disability, but then their account was overdrafted, it became impossible to, to pay it off based on the, the, their lack of income and whatnot. And now they're unbanked because you know, their credit is ruined because of that, that previous experience. So we were looking at, there needs to be some kind of program that can help somebody stay in the system, um, you know, pay off debts over time or something to work with them. That's something that seems to be lacking. Um, and then just one-on-one -on -one access to a banker, to a to a counselor of some sort. Um, right now we see a lot of fees. If you go into the bank too much, you get charged a fee for uh, talking to a person. That's not really an acceptable thing if you're on a fixed income. So um, just having that access to one-on-one -on -one counseling, asking questions about your account and getting that kind of feedback is um, vital. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, do we have uh, another table? Yep, in the middle. The number one core thing we um, came up with is accessibility. 
um, being able to um, make websites uh, accessible, accessibility within the facility, uh, basically being able to cater to the individual needs of the person with a disability as a consumer. Um, so with that being said, make sure that the uh, technology is constantly updated and set up for people with disabilities. Um, and another thing that we talked about was uh, there's a lot of different products that um, different banking institutions are promoting. It would be nice to have products that are also catered to uh, consumers with disabilities that are specific to them. Specifically, what was brought up was insurance products. Um, there's a lot of insurance products out there uh, that the banks are offering, but not much when it comes to uh, consumers or, or banking consumers with disabilities. Okay. Hello, everyone. So we talked about the importance of training on disability etiquette because it's really important to understand when you're serving someone what would be considered rude. And so having some sensitivity training for employees on etiquette was important. And we also thought about that from an identity theft perspective. How do we make sure that if you are serving someone with a disability and they may be a victim of some sort of predatory situation, employees would be able to spot the signs and identify that and provide that protection to a disability, to a person with a disability. We came up with a couple of things that I think are important. One is to work at creating that culture of inclusion from the top down and make sure that you've got buy-in from upper management and that it does flow on down so you can do those disability sensitivity, sensitivity trainings. And then also to designate an ADA or disability coordinator to, so that you have someone in charge of making sure these things happen. Great. I think we have one more group. Uh, my colleague said we should have gone first because, again, everything is said. So <laughs> she said you should have gone first. So what we looked at, we says inclusion uh, should, uh, when we talked about inclusion, it should be with people with disability and see them as asset, more accessibility. And also we thought about, like, for instance, in the bank, well, you find a notary within the bank, you should find someone there that is always there to assist people with disabilities. So not only having a notary, but having someone that is there to help. Uh, and so as far as imagery is important, imagery makes a difference and bringing awareness and training. And again, cultural competency to make sure that everybody is aware of the need for inclusion and fairness and respect. Okay. In that last suggestion, I know from uh, summits we did in other cities, they, uh, when asked to come up with recommendations for this question, um, in several cities, it sounds like what you just said is, they wanted like a, a rapid response team that if you walked into a neighborhood branch of a whatever bank or a credit union, and you, you hit some barriers, uh, you know, it could be a physical barrier, it could be a communication barrier, uh, it could be that uh, uh, using the ATM, there was uh, some type of uh, physical or communication barrier. Um, they wanted to know that rather than trying to talk to someone there in the bank who immediately has not a great idea of what to do to, you know, to eliminate that barrier to participation, uh, that uh, at least the staff there were trained and had a phone number uh, or an email, you know, uh, link to contact someone, uh, whether they're in that state or most banks are in multiple states, they could immediately, you know, they were there for an immediate uh, fast response to break down any barrier and, and have more knowledge in terms of solutions and be able to not uh, be told, well, come back next week or we'll be back in touch with you, but really get an immediate rapid response. So is, is that somewhat similar to what you're talking about? We talked about that. We, we 
mentioned that in our group, especially if they, uh, for we have a sign language interpreter here. And so in the bank, just to have someone who has the skill, because in writing something out, it's that facial expression, that's that tone, and all that, that makes a big difference in what is being said. So these are the things that we need to be considered about. And we talked about the fact that maybe just have someone that they can type or write. But I wanted it to go a little bit further, because I know that the tone and just the, the, in, just the inflection in the voice. So we need all that where someone can actually engage the same way when I walk and I have someone to talk to and have a conversation where each individual can feel a part of that community when they walk in. So to be, okay. it's really to be catered to. Okay. One of the other things which uh, Ms. talked about was imagery and what you mentioned a little while ago. Um, and somebody in the group mentioned that imagery makes a difference. We want to see our people that we, people with disabilities represented not only uh, amongst the staff members, but also amongst the communication tools that are being used, whether it is advertisements or pamphlets or outreach, any method they should have, or family photograph. There should, could be a child with a disability portrayed in it. So you want to see the like, your kind in, the, uh, in that venue too. Okay, before I move to question three, did any group have an additional comment? You're okay? Okay, let's go to question three. Question three, what can disability organizations do to improve their working with people with disabilities in terms of financial education or coaching? Um, and uh, it could be a disability organization or it could be in partnership with, with another organization. Um, who wants to start us off on uh, response? Okay, you're gonna make sure you don't get everyone else to take your answers. I get it, okay. Uh, we wrote that, I think the underlying idea behind all our suggestions was that even the disability organizations need to raise the expectations. We need to raise the bar for ourselves also. And we talked about starting the education early from kindergarten onwards, make financial education a critical component of it. We talked about making a five years, making this a strategic plan for the state, if not for the disability community, have a strategic five-year plan and make financial education a part of it. We also had ideas about IEP meetings, transition meetings, VR counselors, all to be talking about financial planning. Uh, GVRA counselors uh, should be talking about it. Um, there is a new program that uh, the Now and the Comp waiver is talking about Employment Express, which is for folks with uh, intellectual disabilities getting into jobs. So even they should be reaching out and talking about financial planning. So every component, wherever the individual with disability and the families meet, with money should be an important part and changing the mindset. And the VR counselors, that's right. Okay, thank you. We'll go to another group up front. Yeah, so um, to kind of reiterate, um, the previous group we talked about including uh, more financial education services in uh, schools, uh, specifically focusing on the, the transition age, um, making sure that those resources are made available as early as possible to set that foundation. Um, another thing that was mentioned was working with um, people that use rep representative payees, um, ensuring that that payee is gonna be associated with um, some kind of financial institution, um, and that the person is made aware of what the budget that is set up and has a say in kind of how things are set. Um, right now, sometimes people have no clue <laughs> how their uh, payee is spending their money um, or what that budget is looking like. So um, just kind of engaging them in that way would make a, a huge difference. Okay. Okay, a couple of things. Um, first off, sign up for um, a financial um, uh, education class at a local center for independent living. Um, go to local um, banks, uh, bank branches and invite them to come and participate and talk about their products. 
um, uh, mark do marketing and ad placement in disability advocacy magazines um, of all different types, um, some for the blind or like I read new new mobility magazine. So really, you know, getting information out there uh, at the advocacy level through different disability uh, awareness publications. Um, also. Um, Oh, okay. Um, another one is um, October is Disability Employment Awareness Month. So use that opportunity coming up in the next few months to promote uh, what you're doing at the banking level, uh, specifically tailored to the disability community. Um, and again, hire people with disabilities. Okay, um, we talked about, um, well, there's a reason that the um, tidal pond places are so popular because they're easy, they make it easy. So remove barriers for people with disabilities, remove barriers for people like me that don't understand some of that fine print, but um, I'm kidding. But anyway, it would help a lot of people um, just to make it simple, the KISS principle and a lot of things I think then people won't be intimidated by. Um, by the banking institutions, and then we talked about um, the agencies using the financial institutions as a resource. Uh, Danny had talked, a couple of people have talked about transition um, and uh, GVRA, Voc Rehab. Um, we uh, go to businesses to ask for employment for our people with disabilities, but we can also use you all as a resource to come in and talk about job exploration and what kind of careers do you want and bring them in to talk about the financial literacy piece. So using, uh, using the institutions in a way that will educate um, early on. We're just going to put a period on the end of the sentence because everybody said the same things we had. <laughs> oh, all right there. All right, let's go. We'll start with you then. <laughs> on question number four, how do we expand the outreach and education efforts around ABLE accounts? We invite Doug and people like him who can simply explain ABLE uh, <laughs> to talk to um, disability organizations, people with disabilities. The other thing that we thought what would be good is to actually put together a train the trainer about ABLE, similar to the one that um, FDIC has for Money Smart, so that there can be designated people in organizations that they can take it to the larger groups where we can reach people with disabilities. And then also too, looking at ways to establish partnerships between banks and able account managers at the state levels so that we can uh, reach more people either via the banks where they may already have relationships or in other ways. Okay. Okay, um, we talked about just word of mouth. Every one of these very smart ladies at this table, what they learned today, they were texting people and letting them know, do you know about this? Do you know about ABLE? Do you know about all these resources? So um, the word of mouth, so now they're going to go out and be ambassadors um, for the ABLE account, and they'll be telling other people about it. So word of mouth will um, spread the word about these good resources. Get marketing materials out into the community. Definitely um, go even to the local churches, um, local civic centers. Um, uh, promote, Let's see, where, where we at here? yeah, radio and reading services. Um, do promote promos on radio for sure. And then um, re do outreach to the universities, do a presentation, orientation, get involved because uh, students with disabilities transitioning in from high school uh, into the universities need financial aid, so having information about the ABLE um, program right there would be, would be really beneficial. Okay, um, so for question four, um, <laughs> well, the thing we put in all caps and underlined was tell tell them tell them about the stable or the able account the stable account, um, and include uh, when you're doing your outreach include um, things like the uh, 
the PLAs, the teachers, peer groups, pediatricians, faith-based organizations, senior groups, um, because not everybody is regularly going to um, their accessible library service or they're not always going to their SIL. Um, they may be involved with other groups, so we wanna make sure we're hitting from all directions. Um, and then the, the one thing that's kind of underlying all four of these questions um, that we mentioned was uh, policy. There are policy changes that need to be made um, with a lot of this stuff. So underlying all of these questions and all of these things that we've been bringing up and talking about is um, there's some kind of underlying policy change that has to happen to improve the, the inclusivity um, in the financial institutions, to improve access to the services and products that everybody else has access to. So that was uh, something we wanted to, to kind of nail in right towards the end, <laughs> was that, that policy piece that needs to happen. I was really confident in going last that we would have something that no one else would cover. <laughs> um, and, and, and it was close, but, but thanks to the last group, it's just gonna be an extension. Um, I'm the statewide admission services manager for the Now and Comp Waiver. And what I'll do is I'll have our navigators, one in each region who's set up to do customer service and handle all the incoming calls. What I'll do is I'll, make, I'll be sure that they're trained on the ABLE program to be able to share this and be able to refer out on it. Um, we have a collaborative project with Voc Rehab right now. And so if we can get the, uh, the wins that are working with us to be knowledgeable on this too, then they can add that to their piece. Okay. Oop. I think we should reach out to the legal team here, the attorneys, special needs attorneys, and also educate them because at this point of time, because there is no information, there is a lot of misinformation about ABLE account. Okay. All right. Fantastic. I, I took uh, a page of notes for uh, your, your good thoughts and recommendations. Um, what we will do is we're going to collect your, your uh, pages you've used on the big easel pads. Uh, we'll turn those into an even longer set of lists. We then will be bringing them back to you uh, online uh, to help us narrow down to a sort of uh, best of three uh, in each of uh, the four questions, best of three responses that will then go to the work group to really think about, okay, um, it's great to suggest these things, how do we implement them? How can we actually get the kind of collaboration that's been talked about all day? Uh, how do we make it happen? And, and uh, that's again uh, engaging individuals with disabilities and families, uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, uh, public agencies at multiple levels. How do, how do we how do we bring uh, financial institutions? How do we bring it all together? So uh, we'll be don't don't uh, run away with those uh, uh, large uh, sheets of paper that you, you've copied. Our the NDI staff will collect them. Uh, do sign up for the disability work group. I think these forms are on the table. They're on the table. If you want to be a part of the conversation, uh, please uh, fill one of these out and give them to one of the NDI staff. That, that will be uh, very, very important. Um, so uh, let's just check for a moment. You know, we're in a world of, of acronyms. I do want to check. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test your knowledge for a second. Uh, everyone should have some type of piece of paper in front of them. Five acronyms. Uh, some are easier than others. None are should be difficult. And I would expect and hope that at least uh, a third of the room get them all right. You ready? I'm going to tell you the acronym. You're going to write down what, it, what, it, what the actual wording is. I'll start with some simple ones and they'll get harder. All right. First one is CIL. SIL, okay, C-I-L, what is it, what are the words that acronym stands for, C-I-L, that's the first one. The second one is ABLE, A-B-L-E, 
what is it actually, what are the words? We, we, we over and over again said ABLE accounts, ABLE programs, but ABLE has words formed by the, uh, f those letters. So CIL was the first one, then ABLE. The third one is, and we talked about it over and over again, SSI. SSI. What does it actually stand for? Okay. And I'll give you a hint. SS does not stand for Social Security. Okay, SSI, that's the third one. The fourth one is FDIC. FDIC. And the last one, and I have been working with them for uh, 15 years, and I, I have a, just a block in my head. When I try to think of what these letters stand for, I never get it right. So this is the toughest of the five. SPEC, S-P-E-C. We started the day with IRS, and we, uh, they talked with us about one of their divisions called SPEC. Rhymes with Fleck, rhymes with Shrek, but it's Spec, S-P-E-C. Okay, this is like your final Jeopardy. Pens down, all right, all right. Raise your hand, don't call it out. Who wants to tell us what uh, the first one is? C-I-L, anyone wanna raise their hand? I saw this woman over here, okay. Yes, you? Wait, you gotta, you need the microphone. The Center for Independent Living? Center for Independent Living. How many people got that right? Just about everyone in the room. Excellent. All right, they get harder though. The second one was ABLE, A-B-L-E. Okay, a woman raised her hand right there in the middle. Achieving Able. a Better Life Experience. Achieving a Better Life Experience. Correct, how many people got that right? Mm, less, much less. Okay, now you know. The third one is SSI. Any, any takers? Okay, right up front. Hold it, hold it. Get a microphone. Uh oh, they're shaking their heads already. <laughs> she declined. Danny's going to try. Okay. Supplemental support income. Supplemental support income. Did I get that wrong? Did I really get that one wrong? <laughs> so, so, now you got me confused. <laughs> Why can't I? Boy, you. No, no, no. Wrong. We got a right answer? All right. We're going to try Barry over here, who didn't have to look it up on his uh, phone. Supplemental, SSI stands supplemental for security income. Supplemental security income. You were very close. Yeah, you can keep your job. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go the two toughest ones. FDIC. Well, all the way over. Oh, here we go. Okay. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. How many people got that right? Oh, a lot. A lot. All right. Here's the backbreaker. All right. Okay. First, before we go to the last one, how many have gotten the first four right? Ooh, well, only about five people in the room. All right, here's the one to break it all. IRS has a division called SPEC, S-P-E-C. Who's gonna tell us what it stands for? Uh-oh, no one. Uh-oh, really? Okay, Dan, Dan, Dan's gonna tell us again up here. <laughs> All right, ready? I find it, wait, wait, I can't hear. You got to talk in the microphone. It is the Stakeholder Partnerships Education and Communication. Stakeholder Partnership Education and Communications. Who got that right? Yes, yes. All right. Was there anyone left in the room who got all five right? Uh, not a one. No one? Uh, wow. 
Wow. Okay. Well, try that back in uh, with your friends or organization. Um, all right. Here's your bonus question. All right. This is the double jeopardy question. First, write down how much money you're going to wager, anywhere from a uh, one dollar to ten million dollars. You ready? One dollar to ten million. You put down a number. Put down a number. You're ready to wager it. Doesn't mean you have that amount of money, but you're ready to wager between one dollar and ten million. All right. Anyone wagering ten million? You don't know the answer yet. Oh, we got a few. Okay. High high risk individuals. We're not going to trust you with my able account. That's for sure. Okay. This organization in the federal government looks across federal agencies to help put a focus on financial education. No, 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 you got to write it down. You can't call it out. And it, I wasn't done. And it rhymes with Shrek and Fleck. No, I gave it away. I just goofed it up. <laughs> yeah, I goofed it up. All right, scratch that. Scratch that. We'll do a different one. I really ruined it. I ruined it. The answer was Fleck, which I just told you. It should have been rhymes with Shrek and Speck. And the answer is Fleck which is the Financial Literacy Education Commission. Okay, forget that. Give me 10 seconds, we'll come up with a new Double Jeopardy question. Um, okay. All right, you can wager between a dollar and 10 million. All right, here we go. This website has had over 1.5 million visits and is the space you can look at to learn more about all states' ABLE programs? 20 million. 20 million. You're ready. It's another acronym. Dun, da, dun, dun, dun. Okay, and the answer is? Kevin? National Resource Close. We won't accept it. Pam? AbleNRC.org. AbleNRC. The Able National Resource Center. So Able, A B L E N R C dot org. You actually can visit that site and see information about all 30 plus states that have Able programs. You can see all federal guidance that has been issued. Uh, there are uh, short videos to watch, and there are over 20 webinars archived on every subject you can possibly imagine uh, about ABLE accounts. All right. Well, this has been really a, a really terrific day to start our conversation. I must say, those in the room, we're, we're the ones who are survivors. Others have left. They don't know what they missed but we're going to remind them over and over again as we talk with them online or, or other conversations. What's most important is we don't stop here. We really, what was so outstanding about today is we had representatives for the governor. We had representation from city offices. We had all kinds of organizations and financial institutions in the room and I think everyone, as I said at the beginning, what are we here to do? We're here to learn. Um, if we could wave a wand and there was one simple solution, we would have done it. There are a lot of things that can be done. And as I said earlier, it isn't about that uh, uh, the Georgia legislature or the mayor's office and the city council or Congress has to appropriate tens of millions of dollars. It might help. 
uh, in some ways, but this is about really collaboration and coordination of resources. So many things could really happen uh, on a, a really large scale basis with more conversations between government, between financial institutions and the disability community. So do sign up for the work group. Um, do sign up, I believe, in the program. It, it, uh, it has the date, I believe it is, what is it, June 4th, uh, for a training site to be uh, determined. Um, get, oh, June 6th, Wednesday, June 6th, uh, from 10 in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, there will be training related to FDIC's Money Smart that you heard a presentation about and uh, other things uh, brought to you uh, by National Disability Institute. So think about that day. Think about signing up for the work group. Think about signing up for the Real Economic Impact Network. There's a card on the table. Uh, there is a free newsletter that uh, comes to you via email every month. There are webinars almost every month as well for free by different experts from around the country. Um, and uh, again, visit the ablenrc.org where there also are webinars every month for free where you can learn a lot more uh, about ABLE accounts. Um, our call to action is really about not pretending or forgetting about what we did today. Whoop. Um, it's really about making commitments of who can I tell about things that I learned today? Who do I talk to in my organization that I can influence them that financial education and literacy is a part of the discussion as we help people in the disability community become employed um, make better wages, increase their income, but set financial goals. And think about not just short term paying the bills, but think about goals that require savings and investing. ABLE accounts for millions of people are now make that possible. And as we continue to push for amending that law, others, millions, will also have that option available. So, Think about things you learned, think about commitment to action, and uh, engage others, and I hope you will join with us uh, on the uh, work group that's, that's going to follow. I do want to thank again the Shepherd Center for uh, letting us use this wonderful space, um, and I do want to thank all of the NDI staff um, for uh, being here working for months to help put this together, as well as many of you in this room who stayed to the end, who were part of the work group. I think, Mark, you, you wanted to get our attention, and Mark has something well, to Well, I, I just wanted to thank you and your team for coming to Atlanta um, and starting this unified conversation. And I, I'd be remiss in my job if I didn't say there's a very important election in November. <laughs> and some of these things that we're talking about that are and need to be. I hope you'll challenge any candidate running for office to understand where we are and where we need to be before you cast your vote for them. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I just want to recognize our National Disability Institute staff in the back of the room are Katie and Brittany. <laughs> Maggie, raise your hand. Maggie. Um, Who's out the door? Oh, the other Katie, okay. Katie, the other Katie, who was taking photographs as well. Um, and uh, again, um, visit our website, realeconomicimpact.org. Visit ablenrc.org, another of our websites. Um, but uh, uh, again, there's so much we can do collectively, uh, so much better than what we can do individually or uh, separately. So thank you. Uh, I hope we're getting out to avoid the Atlanta traffic, although they tell me that's 24 hours a day. There is no, there is no avoiding the Atlanta traffic, but uh, uh, hopefully maybe uh, by going now, you'll get there faster than by going after four o'clock. And uh, thank you all, and we hope we'll uh, be with you on the phone 
as we start uh, our follow-up workgroup activities. Thank you so much.